Okay, you'll want to go through the uh, process. Hi, right, come on in. You guys, will, you'll want to go through the process of logging into the into the machine, and then logging into VMware, and then from VMware over to the uh, Canvas, and then into the announcement so you can go ahead and join in the screencast. So this is the workaround we're having to do. This is some of the technical issues we're having over here. Okay. Let's see what we got going on. So let me walk you through that process. All right. You'll, want, you'll see the passwords at the bottom there of that. There's a piece of tape and it's gonna be OBU lab, one, two, three, exclamation point, seal one. And that'll get you logged into the machine. Okay. And then you want to, uh, you want to log into VMware And I may be still in here with my options. All right. All right. All right, control agent, go on. You had to do that biz wax. Let's try this. logged in wrong. Okay, what we're going to do is get you over to the announcement there that's got the link to the screencast and then we can go from there. We're important. We'll have some people over there. Now, yes, greetings. I'd see who, let me see who's out here. And I need everybody. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to go over to OKBU. And once I'm over there, now you're going to get a, you'll take a look there. Let me move this over so you can see it. I think I can do that. Um, you'll see on the left hand side there, you should see a little green icon that's, that connects you to VMware. You'll click on it and then you'll log in again and that takes you over to VMware so you can get that to uh, the access application on the cloud. And. No, and I'll see if I can get this jewel. I hear all I will certain log myself out. Here we go. And so you want to log into Canvas. I make sure I'm recording over here. And okay. Once you're in the canvas, you want to go over to 4403. And then you'll go into the announcements section. Okay. And you're going to find the invitation to today's screencast, then just link into it. Then you'll be able to see my screen. Good? Everybody so far? Got about five or ten people out in the hinterlands. And you should have. Also, the VMware, I probably just neglected to log myself out of this. And to get to access, which we'll be using tonight, you want to come all the way down here to the Windows icon at the bottom, the program icon, there's access. Okay?
we're still experiencing the issue or we're having trouble being able to well i won't go into it we we know what we know what the story is anyway hopefully it'll get itself resolved but you'll need to go down to the very bottom there and then once you click into the program area and once you do then you click on access and you'll be able to open it up and use it okay now be with me so far and then once you've done that you can go back in and you should be able to see the screen my screen and I have my screen up for this week week five everybody there okay now I do this in order to in order first of all I've got several I've got some folks who are out remote who are on con who are athletic contests etc and who are out traveling and then I also want to make the recording there for you and make it available so you can come back and take a look at what we might have done and what we did in class excuse me and so you have that there as a backup now the other thing you're going to have a, as a backup as we've been going through this is now we're working through these different pieces of, of uh, sql and what as we talked about last week each time each of the query is going the queries that we write or we paste in, excuse me, are gonna become more and more complex. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be taking a data table and we're going to be more finely cutting till we get, and we're starting it, we're gonna to start to see maybe even smaller result sets because we've really qualified them. And uh, you'll see what we, what we mean when we go and we work through them. Now, first thing you wanna do is make sure that you download to your desktop, okay? the uh, files uh, for the Pat the Patrick files and those are the files that we're using for these lunches database so make sure if you haven't done that that you download it to to your desktop okay now I'm going to go over to files here in in uh, in canvas and I'll find the Patrick files okay and there's the zip file, and we'll want to download it. Now, when I work in Chrome, I go ahead and just put it show in folder, and then I've got the materials. I have the zip file. Yeah, I'll just replace this. I don't know we got down there, but I want to show you, let you see what's going on. And once you've got those files, then you want to open it up. And you're going to see three things. We'll go through this every time we work through these, just to reinforce the concept. We have the data warehouse, and that's that access file called SQL Fun. Got it? Once you download it and open it up, you'll see the SQL Fun file. That's our warehouse that has all of our tables. Okay? Did you find that one? Throw it out on your desktop. And you can rename it. You'll want to. And I'm, I'm going to rename this LD5. And I'll, I'll just uh, SQL Fund 2007 LD5 Harmon Key. Okay. That's the SQL file. When you open the zip file, you're going to see three things. One, you'll see the SQL file. The access file, excuse me. You see that one? Which zip is it? It's the, it's, uh, it's the Patrick materials. Okay, and when you download it, okay, open it up, download it. Okay. Now, go ahead and, uh, yeah. Now you're going to see. Three things. One's going to be the text files. That's the code we're going to be throwing in here and running these queries. All right. And then the second thing you're going to find, there's a little, some uh, errata stuff there. And then there's the file itself, the data warehouse itself, and that's the SQL fun file. Okay. Again, and this is for everybody at home too, what we talked about was what makes this such a, a, a fantastic technology is simply this. I can extract data from those tables 
without ever having to change the tables unless I have the authorization to do it and I have the necessity to do it. Okay? So that's why we work with SQL fun, SQL 2007 fun or whatever I've called that thing each time because we're extracting data from those tables. Now, so that we get the experience of what a DBA does, a database administrator, we're gonna go ahead and play around some tables, create some tables, modify them, and so forth. But when you're at work, you won't, okay? When you're at work, what's gonna happen is you're probably gonna have some kind of a dashboard that has some key performance indicators based on your level of management. And that's underlying that is gonna be the data, are going to be the data tables, okay? That you'll pull data from to analyze and then to create presentations or visualizations. When we go over, when we get down near the end of the course and you do the work with SAS Visual Analytics, okay, you'll be calling some data from the table, you'll be conducting an analysis, and then you'll create a vis, visualization of it. Okay? But the underlying part of all of this, the underlying, the foundation of all of it are the tables. That help? That making sense? Okay, now, this is not, you know, we're not trying, my, my intention is not to turn you into database administrators. My intention though is for you to be able to have a community, uh, uh, is to have a, a intelligent conversation with those folks when you need their help or you need to do a query. And it's also, it's good practice for you to do some coding. Now SQL, SQL, is not that difficult to do. And we're gonna see that over and over because we'll be able to pull the code up and we'll be able to just basically talk, walk through, just what does this say in English? What does it say is in human speak? But the, uh, every, every job that's out there, when I go out to the job boards like monster.com and look at, look at the job openings, you see more and more that employers are saying, I want people who can do coding. It may be SQL, it may be non-SQL, it may be Python, but almost every job, marketing, finance, management, they want you to have some skill levels in coding. Now what will be for you, what will be the great advantage that you'll have when you go out and apply for a job is this. When you sit down with an employer, you're going to be able to say, I've worked with structured query language. I understand about data warehouse concepts. I've worked with SAP and SAS and Oracle, which are the three top commercial products. And having worked through and worked with, having worked with Access, which is the mother of all databases, you'll understand the functions and the features of this. And it's kind of like learning how to drive a car. Got me? Okay. So once you see this, you go, oh, okay. So when you encounter a, a commercial product, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I, I get it. Does that make sense? Well, let's do a little bit of work here. Let's open up uh, the access file, and that's our warehouse, okay? And then we'll enable the content. And I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I have saved, I save this on my desktop so that I've taken it out of a temporary status in Moodle, pardon me, in Canvas, I'm sorry, and into a permanent status on my desktop. So I've got on my desktop, and I'll save it. And then, once we've worked through Lunch's Database 5, that chapter five tonight, you can just upload it, and you're good to go. Because the queries will be saved. You got me? So, but we're gonna use this same set of tables over and over and over. Now, again, we're gonna, we're gonna play with some of these tables, we're gonna add some stuff to them, we're gonna create some tables, take some things away. But when you're, when you're working with, when you go out to work and, and you open up your machine, whether it's a tablet or it's a laptop, and you get your dashboard, stuff that's important, that you're monitoring. Underneath it's gonna be all the company data tables. 
And we've talked about the different types of data tables. We've talked about dimension tables, okay? Those tables that just indicate like a variable. And let's look at this one for just a second. Open up the constants, ta constants table and you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? This is a table that just has some constant data. It's what it is, it's there. It might be a table that gives a list of our market channels like the internet, direct sales, phone, etc. That's a dimension table. Then we have a fact table. And we'll go down, we'll take a look here for just a moment and let's see if we can find one, okay? Well, show one here. Let's open up the departments. And here we are. This is a dimension table, excuse me. This is the departments and their codes. Okay? These are like variables and then sub variables or dimensions and sub dimensions. Does this make sense to you? Because this tells us the type of data that we're going to collect. Sometimes people will use the term metadata. Let's look at the employees table. Now here is a fact table. You say, what do you mean? Let's look at the first row there. I have a number of dimensions. So what, are, what, do, we, what do you mean? Okay, here's their employee ID. Here's their first name, the last name, the department, the date they were hired, there's a, a part of the department code, excuse me, the date they were hired, the credit, they, the amount of credit they have for their lunch, this, they're keeping track of people buying lunches, and then a phone number, and then the manager they report to. This is a fact because each of these records is unique, okay? You with me? And they're, they're unique. So because they're unique, that gives me the ability to mix and match them with other records out of other tables and start to pull together data. The whole idea here is ultimately, and we'll see this when we get to the end of the course, when we're combining tables, splitting tables, and all that type of thing, the ultimate purpose here is to leverage what we call the law of large data, okay? The more information I have, the better chance I have of identifying a customer's characteristics or their habits, the better chance I have to look at, at um, transactions that occur and patterns of them. When do people buy my product? What time of day? What website do they go to buy it, et cetera? Do they ask to get it to, do they, when they ask for delivery options, do they choose a day or two or days? What, all of those things. And so if we went over to Amazon tonight, Really what we do is we'd be filling out more data that they put in their tables so they can extract it out and get a better picture of us. You with me? Now, one of the reasons that, that this thing, and we've talked about it, some big data, okay, is such a powerful idea and has and really become a tool for businesses is very simple. If you wanted to catch a shark, you wouldn't go to Lake Ufala. Where would you go? Do I catch a shark? Where do I go? I go to the ocean. So the more data I collect, okay, the more data I have to look at customer transaction patterns, to look at customer background patterns, et cetera. Now, with this comes, uh, the, the, that's the good news. So when you go to Amazon, they know everything you bought all your life. The bad news is it raises some privacy questions. And so one of our other, other texts, we have some questions about, are we, to what extent are we invading somebody's privacy if we know that they bought pink slippers on Tuesday the 18th of November 2013 and they had and they ordered them through UPS and had them delivered and they wanted them delivered the next day have I invaded their privacy or have I just simply kept a record that helps me understand them better and you've had the same experience I have had when you go out and you search for something Right, a product, and then all of a sudden you start getting banner ads. <laughs> and you go, oh, okay, great. Or you go into Amazon. Now, 
just to review for us before we go too much further with this, for every one of our tables, especially, well, especially the fact tables, we're gonna have some other types of elements. Now, take the shutter bar and move it over just a little bit and you'll see it says all access objects. See that? Now, let's look at and see if we can find any forms. And we have an employee entry form, and let's open it up. A form is simply a device that we use to input data to populate a table. I doubt, frankly, that any of you will be working with tables, but you will be working with forms or your company will be working with a form. And if you'd like to see a form in action, click on Google and let's open up a brand new tab and let's go over to Amazon. All right. Amazon, this is a form. It wants me to run some queries to look for some products and it will store my address. And if I log in, it'll say, hi, Keith, welcome back. Here's some stuff you might want to have or buy, et cetera. And they also combine this with what they call a recommendation engine. Look at all the junk that we're going to try to sell you. And they always try to find high margin complimentary con uh, high margin complimentary products. And then they got stuff they think, well, maybe you'll just want to buy huh, deal of the day. And now I'm not Julianne, that's my wife but that you could see the junk they've recommended for. Pet supplies, and they've got a list of her orders, beauty and personal care, etc. cetera. Huh? She's always shocked <laughs> at how. So I sat down one day and said, look, it's a recommendation engine. It recommends products. Why? Because they want to sell you stuff, right? So, that's kind of the big picture of all of this. Let's go back now to our form. Now, the form, if you look at it, I, I can. it's a lot more palpable to enter data this way than it is to just sit in a blank table and enter, right? If I want, I can, I can take this thing and customize it. I can you know, put a picture of my dog on it. I can, or my favorite sports teams. It's searchable. If I want to, I can add some things like notes. If this was a call center form, it would have information on the, con the, the, the potential customer I've contacted. And then if I have some discussions with them, I'd have some notes that I'd keep, especially if it's a business to business kind of, of situation, because I'd have some notes and say, hi, hi, Bill, how you doing? Uh, uh, so sorry about the Phillies. I know you're a big Phillies fan. Wow, that was awful blah, 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 okay? So we've worked with the form and we can come into this form and we can change it, alter it, whatever. Right click on the tab where it says employees entry form or you can go up in the far left hand corner and we'll be able to go down to the, the layout view and this is where we can do some manipulating with the size of the fields. Or we can go all the way down to a third and that's called the design view. Now you'll notice something about this. This is a little bit off putting to understand what's going on. The design view is really for the person who is a web designer type or designer type of person. That's why you've got it divided off by the lines and the dots so you can get everything really beautifully precise. As I said before, Access is the mother of all databases, and Access is really a good way to understand how all of these databases are put together. It's designed to do that. That's why we use it here, so that you can become familiar with this tool and understand it. And then we'll do some, we're going to write, so we're going to paste in some SQL, look at some, run some queries. And we'll see the data extraction process as we go along. Make sense? Okay. Now, one of the great things about this is very simply, when you go out and you compete for a job, and you will, because it's the most competitive job market that's ever, ever existed, 
everybody that leaves business school is going to be an excellent spreadsheeter. Okay, they're going to they're going to be able to do spreadsheets. They'll do Excel all day long. Most of them though won't understand what a database is all about, much less how to use one. So when they get set in front of a product that's essentially a database, it's going to be a little bit sketchy for them. Now. When you guys get to the end of the course and you work with like SAS Visual Analytics, which is the holy grail of, I want all the analytical computing power, number crunching power of Excel, I want it combined with the power of a database, the ability to link tables and draw information together and extract it. It won't be that big of a deal. But for people who have not had that background, they're going to be swimming uh, with the hand water above their head a few times. Okay, you got the shutter there. Let's look at the shutter again. And this time, in let's look at the we've got the the forms. Let's look at the queries. Click on that. Okay, did you see the queries? Let's choose the very first one. Okay, this is just a simple query where it just runs a series of numbers. That's all. Now, if I want to know where did this thing come from, all right, I can click on the design view, click on that, and before I, before I uh, forget, always remember I've got a couple of ways I can see from the, what we call the result set view, to the design view, to the query view, I can either look up here, let me stop it a minute and annotate that a little bit so I'm not just pointing my finger here or here. Got it? Okay, let me erase that and we'll go back and take a look at our query. Okay, now let's. Think about what we see here. I've got a thing called a field name. That's a dimension, a variable, if you will. The business name, right? And then it says the data type, short text. Now we'll get into this some, not to a great extent, but the data type is, is important for us for two reasons. One to the extent to which I can take it and export it to something like Excel and then easily transform it into something that makes sense to people or it looks nice. But number two, it's a question of money. If I'm dealing with 150 or 250 or 300,000 records, half million records, it's not a big deal. Server space is pretty cheap. If I'm running 10 million records or 100 million records, this becomes real money. So this issue of the data type becomes important for me. Got it? Yes? Okay, now, I've got the next piece of, uh, of information here. This is the business start date. Right now, if I just stopped at this point, I could say, okay, I'd like to know the name of all of my clients who started doing business with me in 2014. Why? Well, it's 2019 and it's our fifth anniversary and I want to send them a nice card or I want to send them a card and some complimentary gift or I want to send them a card and call them. Call them? Okay. Now, the lunch budget. Well, I might want to say, all right, if these folks have been doing business with me for five years, and they've been loyal customers, I wanna make sure if I take them to lunch, you know, I don't, I don't give them some grinchy deal. I take them to a nice place to eat, right? They've been loyal customers. So I might wanna review the lunch budget. I wanna see what that's gonna look like. What we've done is we've taken some data that we've got stored in a machine, and now we've transplanted, transformed it into something in my head that I can use to make a decision or do something positive. So make sense? Now we have the owner name. That'd be nice to know. We wanna know who, what their name is. 
And so we've got this, the, we've got this query that we've got pulled open, pulled here, and we're ready to go. Now, let's go ahead and close all these, okay? And we're gonna run a query, all right? So click over on file, pardon me, click on create, and then let's diminish the screen down for just a sec, and you'll go over there, and when you look at the Patrick materials, remember, you had that set of access SQL code for each of these chapters, okay? Let's pull that. So every night, we count, every night we're gonna have the code, the data warehouse, and then some, and he's got some kind of uh, errata or stuff that he made some errors on, but those kinds of notes. So let's open this up up, and let's come over to chapter five. Now, it would be a good idea to have your book with you. If you don't have your book, you ought to have it with you. If you have it, you ought to have it with you and have it open, right to chapter five. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through some queries that are a little progressively, a little more developed than what we worked with last time. Now, and you'll see this when you look through, one of the things that the author's gonna do is help you differentiate a little bit between Oracle and SQL code. Oracle SQL and Access SQL, they have some nuances and they have some command and they have some commands in there in in uh, in Oracle that don't that don't work in access and vice versa. And he's got some things like the auto commit, the rollback, the transactions. That stuff, eh, you know, you can kind of skip it. Okay. When we come over, he's gonna walk through there in page 178. That's some good information. But then over on page 179, he talks about modifying data through a view. And if you've got your book, I want you to take a look there. Open it up, take a look, because it's got some important thing to see. Take a look at the middle of page 181, okay? You're gonna see what happens when we extract data. You're gonna see that, that you see the table, and then you get a thing called a view, right? And we talked about this some last week. You said, well, what do you mean by a view? A view is a picture I get when I run a query and I take just a piece of the table out. It's kind of like Photoshopping, okay? I cut out the stuff I don't want. I keep the stuff I want. I just want to see, I want to view the information from that table that's relevant to me that I got running the query. You see it? So I'm not dealing with any extraneous data. I run the query and I get a picture, boom, it takes a snapshot. Now, the code gets saved, the table doesn't get altered. We'll do some table alterations, but throughout your career, unless you decide to become a database administrator and you go through all the training to do it, et cetera, you'll be just pulling views out of the data. You'll get a look at it, okay? But you don't have to change the table. That's the thing that makes it this such a powerful technology. Now, he gives us some code here, and then, as we take a look there in the, at page 182, I want you to watch, see that as well. That's why you need to have the book with you, not just only. The book is important for a couple of reasons. One, it has some of these really nicely developed diagrams that helps me see what he's trying to communicate to me and understand. Number two, it will show me the beginning table, okay? And then it will show me the results set. So I can see what I extracted out and you'll have some notes for us that will explain what happened. If you take a look at page 182, you're gonna see this process, okay? You have a beginning table, right? I have a table of all of the people in Tulsa who are 35 years of age and graduated from the University of Tulsa with a degree in uh, engineering between the years 1970 and 1990. I'm running a donor list. So I get a beginning view. Okay, I get that list of people. 
Then I do some work with that. Then I do a third step where I go ahead and I change the data. I might export that table out to Excel, that the result of the query, excuse me. And then I'm ready to get an ending view. And then I'm ready to go back to the table. There's a cycle that happens. You follow me? Now, one of the important things that we do when we extract this data and these technologies are designed to let a database be a database and let a spreadsheet be a spreadsheet. I can take, I can extract the data from a database, throw it in Excel, and then in Excel, I can do all the computational work, and in addition to that, I can do beautiful charts, visualizations, et cetera. And we, we played with that just a little bit, okay? Follow me? Okay, now, we've got this first, and there's, this is at the bottom of, this is at the bottom of page 183, and we're gonna run this first view, And I'll size this up so we can see that. And let's talk about what this is saying to us in English. Okay, it's, it's saying select. Can somebody tell me the fields that we're gonna select? Are those listed there for us? And what are they? Okay, the employee ID, the first name, okay department code, the credit limit, and where am I getting them from? Okay, right now you know more SQL than 90% of the people on planet Earth. And it's, it's really not that hard. It's very simple. This is what we call a command language. So we just tell the machine, here's what I want. Get it for me. So we said, I want these fields, I want this data, and I want to get it from that employee table. Is there a conditional statement that I've attached to it? And what's the condition? Exactly. That's that where condition. We talked about that last week. So where the, the department code equals ship, which is shipping. So we're <laughs> going to get everybody in there who's in the shipping department. Now, 95% of all queries that you're ever gonna work with are gonna have those elements, okay? And you'll see, after a while, it's gonna happen. We're gonna select, and here's what we're going to select, and here's where we're gonna get it, and then if we wanna qualify it, we wanna more finely tune the extraction, then we say where this department code equals shipping. So we use a Boolean statement, a logical statement that says equal. Yeah, so far? Yeah? Okay. Well, let's do that. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna get rid of this here for a moment. And I want to go ahead and let's select. And then we end it, we end this statement with a semicolon. So here's the fun part. We're gonna click, uh, we're gonna click. Control C and we're going to we're going to get this jewel down and get ready to insert it into the into the call into the machine and run our query. So size back up, size your um, size your uh, access file back up your work your database. Okay, click create. Okay, and then we're going to do query design. Okay. So far, so good. And I'm going to click, I'll close it off, and I'm going to go to the SQL view. And just to be nice here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get that annotation, and I'm going to get the eraser and get rid of that stuff. Okay. Now I'm at the SQL view, and I'll go ahead and I'm going to get rid of that select statement. And then I'm going to slap in the code. And then in honor of 
Forrest Gump are going to do what? Run. See the little exclamation point run? So we're going to say, run, Forrest, run. Okay. So we'll click it and we'll run the query. And there's our result set. Now, Let's size these out and see what we got. Okay. Take your cursor, size that out. We've got the credit limit. We've got the department. Everybody from shipping. Okay. We've got their employee ID, their first name, and their last name, and their department code and their credit limit. Now, the employee ID is important because it's what we call a what? Huh? It's identification, it's the primary key. And we talked about that. It's a primary key, which means it is, it makes that record unique. You say, if I had 10,000 employees, is it possible that I would have two people named Martha Woods who work in shipping and have a credit limit on their lunches of 25 bucks? Yeah, they might work across the country. That's why I give them an employee ID. That's why when you log in, you have two IDs. Probably your, probably your school ID and then your social security number or some variation of that. But that's what makes this a unique record. So when you go to log in, and in, in, in to use banner, you come to log in over here, it wants a unique identifier so it knows who you are. Same story here, so that we know we don't have any duplicates, we know these are distinct people, and we have a good set of data. Make sense? Now we've just done a view, we've taken a view, we've taken a snapshot of some of the content that's in that, that's in that, uh, in that table. Let's go ahead and save this. And I'm gonna save it as 5.5, five, okay? So let's put it, make it, call it task 5.5. Five. Okay. You say, at this point, you might be saying to yourself, hmm, this is kinda of getting boring. Yeah. And if it is, that's good. <laughs> if you're still going, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. It, well, that's not good. The question then becomes, all right, how much, how more, how more finely do I want to cut the data? In other words, get the extraction and make it more and more targeted. Now, to help you, take a look over on page 184, okay? You got your book, take a look at page 184, and they're gonna show you the beginning table. And you're gonna notice all the records and all the data that's listed in there, okay? And then look at the top of page 185 and you'll see the extracted set of data. Okay, make sense? Yeah? No? We had that beginning table, and we said, I want everybody who works in shipping, and I want to get their credit limit, and I want to get their first and last name, and I want to get their employee ID. And I think we also, we may have gotten there, we got their department code, the employee ID, yeah. So we've listed everybody there. Now, could we qualify that further? Well, yes, we could. We could say, I want everybody in there who has a credit limit greater than 25 bucks. So let's do this. Right click on the tab and go to the design view. Now this is the view where you're typically gonna be working. You're gonna have the table you can work with or the data set you can work with and then you'll be able to choose, okay, I want this field, I want this field, I want this field and then any qualifiers. So you see the line called criteria? Notice that we have on that criteria, we have SHP shipping, right? So if I wanted the same data for another, 
for people in another department, what do I need to change? The department, right? Nothing else. I just copy this query and then I change the department. I run that and I get the data for that department, exactly. That's the nice thing about this. I can change those criteria there to suit my needs. So let's go ahead and do this on the credit limit. And I know what we're gonna get here is let's put um, greater than 25. Okay? Now we should get an empty set because everybody had $25. So we'll run the query and there it is, right? Because everybody had a credit limit of $25. If we reversed it and said, Less than 25, they're all gonna show up. Now in this case, we might have a situation where we've got people, folks who are, who have all kinds of different levels of credit and I might use the between and we'll get there when we work with the between clause between 50 and 75 bucks, okay? Now, this becomes exciting when your boss walks in on a Monday morning and says, I'd like you to identify all of the people who have purchased product X from us or subcomponent X or whatever from us for the past five years who are within zip code, blah, 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 blah. I'd like their name and their phone number And it shouldn't phase you, because you know what you're after. So you'll pop into whatever tool you're using, you run the query, and boom, you've got it. Once you have that information, you can roll. Question. Oh, for sure. Yeah. If you if if you let's say you have I don't know uh, the brake pads on. Everything between uh, the Toyota brake pads for the rear brake for a car er, that have been made between a, uh, X date and Y date. And they'll probably have all of the manufacturer's serial numbers for every single one of those brake pads or they'll have a SKU with them, like a barcode. And they'll just call that up or get all those barcodes out of the sequence and boom, they know where they are. And then what they do is they'll go in and they'll have it and they'll have that with that information, they can go and say, okay, these 450 cars ended up at Lou Fuse, these ended up at Kuterberg, and they have that data there. So then they can send a customer a letter and say, hey, come get it. Instead of having to do a blanket letter to everybody who's ever bought that car and say, uh, we got a problem, folks, because <laughs> they really they, they really don't want a lot of that out there. And pharmaceutical companies have to do that in the event of a problem with with a pharmaceutical product or food. Same story there. So for sure, yes, you use the dimensions to create unique records, but that you can pull. So if you need something on a, a temporal basis. Let me show you something for a minute. Diminish your SQL for a second. And a, that's an excellent question, but let me pop back here. I want to show you something, okay? And this will help answer your question a bit in terms of what we were talking about. Let's go back over to the mo modules file, okay? And let's scroll down here. And I'm going to try to find, these are the course resources, and I want to, let's come down and find. The here it is, analytical cube. Okay. Now, if you take a look, you may have to size it up a little bit to see it completely. But notice how we take we go from a flat sheet like we do in Excel to we kind of have a multi-dimensional look. See, I'm kind of looking down into the cube. I've got the product. I've got all of the different 
uh, outlets where I purchased, I've got the date, the amount, all of those extractions. So sure, for a product recall, it's no different than if I want to send a mailer out to everybody who's bought a Marco's pizza in the past 25 days or 30 days, and they say, hey, we're running a deal. And you go, how did Marcos know that I, I, want, I, might, I want a deal on a pizza? It's simple. You bought one you know, Sunday when you skipped church and you were a sinner. Okay. But don't tell them that you bought beer along with the pizza for Sunday morning. That is not good. So I'm trying to integrate a little faith with, with learning here. You follow me? Does that help some? Now, depending on what I'm working with, if, if you look at that dot, if you look at that schematic for a minute, you're going to see some things that almost everybody would want, like amounts, dates, okay? Then you'll see some things that are unique to the particular business. If you're a retailer, you know, your stores, maybe regions, etc., or if you're a manufacturer, the parts, or where they were assembled, etc. That help? Now, what's really interesting about this, and one of the things that gets me, it, it gets me jazzed up about this, is pretty simple. Now we're embedding chips into products, into inanimate objects, which allows us then to see how they're used. People, folks who are in the business of farming now use database technology to the nth degree. Now, which leads me back to something that's kind of a nice segue, and then we'll go back to doing some more coding, all right? I'm more interested in you understanding than writing a whole bunch of codes. We're gonna do that, but I want you to get it. Once you get it, you go, oh, this is a really different way to look at my business especially how I collect the data. Um, <laughs> our guests will appreciate this. I worked with a church, still working with them, and for their new visitor, well, it's only to fill out when people visit, okay? They had 47 questions, and they kept wondering, why do I, have got, why do I get these reports with nothing in them? And I said, because you're asking way too many questions. What do I want to know when someone visits? Who are you? Where are you from? How do I contact you? And can I come by your home and harass you for the next six years? No, you want to do that. So I can identify it. When we whittled the 47 questions down to about 10, suddenly the reports are there. And boom, they're making sense. Then I was able to say, okay, do we know where these people are coming from and can we put them on a map? And so I took some real simple mapping technology and we have GPS, which is really nothing more than just a set of coordinates. And maps are really nothing more than, we talk about this, of just layering stuff over different views. And where do these folks come from? Is there a zip code that contributes to my visitor, to, to the folks who visit me? Do I know how far they drive? Because we know that when people drive up to 15 minutes, at 15 minutes, they stop. The percentage who will attend your church just go, boom. Now, the great fun I had was when I sat down with the pastors, et cetera, and said, tell me the five things you need to know every single day. And I said, we're going to exclude one question. That's when the Lord returns. No one knows but the Father. Okay, so let's leave that one out. Although it would have been fun to have some dates and speculation stuff and all that. Okay, But what are the five things you need to know? And boy, that was a six-month struggle. And they wondered why they were having some problems. What would you need to know? The five things every day. Do the same pastors need to know the same thing? Does the senior pastor need to know the things different from the associate pastors? An ownership issue. Whew. That was fun to work through that. And I didn't take a check from them. 
for a very simple reason. I wanted to help them because they were floundering. And the good ship's kind of working its way through. Okay, so we looked at that. And I want to go back here and look at the modules and go back to the modules. And let's go to today's module because I want to show you something before I forget about it. I'm more about you understanding as well. Look, once we've done enough of this coding, you're gonna go, this is simple stuff. I can go into the design view and write some code and generate it, or I can generate the code writing it, okay? It doesn't really matter. I can get what I need to. But let's look at week five, okay? And I wanna show you some things that I think are important for you to see. I always try to provide you with a set of resources here or examples where we see databases used, okay? There's a lot there for you to look at. And many times I have students who'll say to me, oh, I'm getting a degree in business, what can I do really good with it? And I'd say, if you can get on with a humanitarian organization, it'll be a tremendous experience for you. And what you'll see is that they become very data-driven. They have to. Uh, I, I, for 10 years, as I've shared with you, I'm an official moron. I lived in Moore for 10 years. And when I moved to Oklahoma City, they, the city council there made me a, a moron, okay? I'm an official moron. When the tornado hit in 2013, right after it hit, I went out with some folks and we took a look and we we're going, oh my goodness, nothing is recognizable. I can't see a thing. Nothing's there. Then they had to start, then the folks that had GPS could start determining where the streets were, where this was at, and then they used Google to come back in and look at pictures of where everything was. Got it? Okay. So we're back over here and we're still working on our, our query. And we've run this query task 5-5. Five five. And now we've got a series of, of queries here at the bottom page 185. And they're also going to be over here in the text file. Let's take a look at it. Here is where I'm going to be inserting some data. How do I know? Because it says insert into. I'm going to insert that into SEC 0505 shipping department view and the values 212. That's one query. I'm going to, here's another where I'm going to in, in put in, put in some more data. Okay. That's the reason I have a form is so I don't have to write query after query after query. I can import, I can use a form to put the data in. But if I were to ask you, let's look at five, five example, one, step three. What are we in, what are we doing there? Okay, we're changing, it was changing the credit limit. And what's the key word that helps me understand that? There's a word there that helps me understand I'm changing the credit limit. Huh? It says update, exactly. These will typically mean what they say and say what they mean. I'm gonna insert into, update, and then we're gonna delete. We can delete some records. And notice we're working with the same shipping department. So there's about four or five different queries there that I can run as I'm changing that table. As I said before, we can go in and we can change and alter a table if we have the permission to. In this case, we've been given kind of the power to do anything with this database we want to. Okay? If you see the code and you get it and you understand it, you're good. Now, I'm gonna update the credit limit and which employee is gonna be affected or impacted. Which one? Okay, exactly. Where the employee is, 203. Now, if I look at the next query, it's the same kind of pattern that's going on there. I'm going to delete employee 208. That's how I use that employee ID, where the employee ID is 208. And 
So I've got four or five different queries that I'm going to run to change that shipping department view. You follow? Now, if you look at the bottom of page 185, they're going to show you the ending view where you've gotten the ID, the first name, last name, and the department code, and the credit limit. And then you pop over to the to page 186 and you see the beginning table. And then the ending table as you do these different queries. And again, we see that pattern. We're going to update, we're going to delete, and the table. And we identify it, we use where equals, boom, and we've got the semicolon and we're good to go. Okay. Now, as we always do, we're going to go till 7.15, maybe 7.30, and that'll be the ground-based part of this. And then what I'll do is I'll take another 60 to 90 minutes and run some queries that will become part two. So we've got another 15 or 20 minutes. And I'm really trying to focus more on quick Q&A and understanding stuff. And then I can just run the queries and let you see that happen. Okay? Does that make sense? Because then you can watch, and if you have a question, of course, you can always stop it and say, okay, what's the hour and the minute, and send me an email and go, hey, Dr. Harmon, I didn't understand what was going on here. Okay? That's the same pattern we've been doing throughout. They have a whole bunch of modifications there, and then the Oracle Data Dictionary, and they go through all of that business. I'm going to show you the data dictionary, and we'll save this. We'll save this query, and let's quick click back over here in the shutter bar, and let's go back up to the table, okay? And let's come down here to the lunches table, and let's open it up in Design View. In Access or any database, you ultimately have this. Is, this is what we call the data dictionary. And if this was done for real, you'd have the field name, the type of number, okay? The number type, excuse, the data type, excuse me, and then the description. And if I make modifications, the date and the name of the person who changed it. It's empty here, but you do it for real. You'll, have, you'll want that documentation so you know what happened. And you'll, you'll probably have employee logins that will track it anyway, so they know and if you have the permission to go in and change the table. Because it's so important, few people do. Now, there's something here about this lunches table in this design view that tells me what I'm using to create a, re, a unique record for all of the records stored in this table. What is that? It's giving you a cube. You see the little key? That's the primary key. If you look up in the ribbon, it's going to tell you this is the primary key. Now, again, when you've taken some other courses with me and we've talked about the, two, the uh, the visual cues that you get, same story in Access. It suspiciously mimics Excel and Word and PowerPoint for a reason, because you have tabs, functions, and then trees. So if I want to reverse engineer something or understand what I did or what I'm looking at, I can look up into the ribbon area and it will tell me. You see where the primary key is dark? And then on the lunch ID and the field name, you see a little key. That's a primary key. That makes this a unique identifier. Now, in this case, they've, they've used a lunch ID and they've as assigned a number. Typically, what they'll do is they'll either assign a number or they'll assign what we call an auto number and that is each time I generate a new record, a new number is made. 
Make sense? You say it really could not be this easy. It truly is. Now the difficult part of this and part the folks over in computer science do is build the code for the database and embed it in a website or embed it in an interface I have with a customer or something of that sort. That's the hard work. Probably the more difficult work is what you'll do and that is, what do I need to know? What fields do I need in these tables? What information do I need to collect and how often? And who owns this information? How should I handle it? That's why we call this course data administration so you're thinking about that. What more can I know about a transaction that might help me understand where something went wrong or something else about a customer? So I'll get some visual cues and I've got one right up here with a primary key and then also here. Yeah? I wish it was more difficult than this, but it's truly, it's truly not. As I said, I am an honorary moron and even a moron can understand this. Now, when you come down and look in the area called field properties, okay, you're going to see some things like the size of the field, the precision, that is how many digits, the, dec uh, the scale, the, the decimal places, excuse me, the precision, and any input masks, let's close this off for just a moment and we'll just review just real quickly an input mask. So click on the employees table, good. And then let's go to the design view of it and click on the phone number field, okay? Now we'll get into this a little bit later but I kinda like to give you a nice little taste of this. As we come down here, take a look and we're gonna see the thing called the input mask. You see it, the third line? Okay, click it. And then click the three little dots. And you'll see that if we wanna control how the data are inputted into that field, we can use a thing called an input mask. So when we talk about data validity and referential, what we call integrity, we won't, we'll control how the user inputs the data. We'll provide them some things like a drop down menu that lets them choose the state. Do you want to spell Mississippi or Massachusetts 53 times? No. And, you, but your, your customer or you or the people inputting the data will know, oh, okay, I think Massachusetts is what is MT's Montana? Anybody know what Massachusetts is, the two, two zip code designator? I know Michigan's MI, Montana's MT. MA? Okay. We know it's Oklahoma is okay. Texas is TX, Tennessee's TN. A lot easier than spelling it out and a lot less to store. So we use a thing like an input mask to control how the user puts data in. Okay, and if you go and you buy something online, you'll see like if when you enter your credit card, you know that little, the, 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 every, the last four digits of the credit card will usually show up because you've, there's a data, there's an input mask that masks the rest of it. And then when you put in your little security code, you won't be able to see it. So no one else can see it. And you make your transaction. But we take a look at this, we can see, and we can even try it. You click down here and try it, boom. Okay. So this is a way to make sure that, uh, you know, we're good to go and that the data are inputted as I want them to. Because you will have the pleasure at some point in your career, maybe, of going out to work and on Monday morning, you'll have employees who will be inputting data and maybe over the weekend they had one too many Red Bulls, maybe one too many domestic disturbances, <laughs> and things are not good, and you get junk out of your table. But if you have the, the kinds of things like input masks built in to control the input, 
your gold because the records won't store if they're not inputted correctly. And we'll see it as we move on. Okay? Now, I'm still looking through here for the data day share, and it talks about the, if you want to see replicated in your textbook what we're looking at here on the screen, you can go over to page 203, okay? And you'll see the access GUI, okay? And that method. So you see icons and names and things that you can relate to fairly easily. And there's the employee ID, same table. Now I want you to notice something as we come on down the field properties, notice that I've got indexed. Yes, no duplicates. Indexing allows us, allows the machine to search as it likes to search based on probabilities. So what are you talking about? Well, we know for example, the, the, the folks' last names tend to congregate around certain letters. And so when a machine goes searching last names, it goes right to the biggest piece of all of that. The computer science take a, students take a course called data structures so they can understand this stuff. So when they build an index and they do, when they build a database or they take a commercial product and adapt it for use, that database will do the search in the most efficient way possible. It won't check every record. It will go where it thinks things are going on. Okay. It's like storm chasers. Now, storm chasers start looking for funnel clouds and they confirm with the people back at, at, the, you know, at the news station and they show you all those incredible graphics. And then Val says, I've got one on the ground. Are there any storm freaks here other than me? I'm the only one. Okay. But it, it, tornado season is, here's what I wanna see F5s every day but are out in the country and don't hurt anybody, including the birds and the bees. That's heaven to me. So we can track that thing as, and we see the lowering and all that stuff. But unfortunately, we live in a fallen world, so it's bad news. So hopefully it saves people's lives. All right? So we've got that GUI there, and we can see down in the field properties, so we have it, it's indexed, so it can search faster. Now, that doesn't mean... When you start to talk about 100,000 records or 200,000 or half a million or a million records, indexing is incredible. If you want to see a really fast index, let me show you one. Huh? It's called Google, and I'm going to put it in. Now, I also want to tell you something, quite important. This is how I live out my faith and my patriotism. There are two baseball teams I support. The Yankees, because I'm a patriot, and the Cardinals, because I love the Lord. It all works together if you integrate it. You have an integrated life? We're good. So the Cardinals, so I'm going to put Cardinals um, magic number. I don't like saying that because I'll, I'll, be, I'll be checking my computer to see if I'm doing like wizard stuff. And I've got the Cardinals number to clinch the division. Look at the results I got and how long it took me to get it. The secret sauce for the folks at Google is their indexing. They came up with this incredible algorithm that lets them just produce these thousands of results. Boom. Hundreds of thousands of results. I don't know how I ever lived without Google. I'm watching movies. I ask my wife, is, is she still, is she dead? Let's see. Used to be there'd be arguments and fights or, or you'd sell it over Trivial Pursuit. Any of the three of you know Trivial Pursuit ever heard of it? Okay. All right. I digress. But there on page 203 in the text, they talk about that data dictionary and the use of indexing. Now, as I said, there's not a tremendous amount in chapter five, and that's why t t 
today, I want to just kind of focus more on some understanding things, looking, looking ahead a little bit, and at the same time, uh, try to review some material for us. All right. Now, at this stage of the game, we've run the queries that we would need to run. So I would save this as, and you're going to save it, and I'm going to save it and then upload it for your demonstration or workshop credit. Got it? He's had enough. He's going to write, get that madman out of the classroom now. I don't blame him. And so you want to upload that for the credit. Now, I want to show you something here. If you take a look, I have a key there for you for Lunch's Database 5 that has several queries and so forth run for you, as well as four. So if you would want to take a look at it, which I would encourage you to do, I'll download it and take a look at it. But upload what you've got tonight. Chapter five is really more conceptual material than it is running a whole bunch of code. Has this been helpful? Has it been the most exciting evening you've ever spent? Well, you're truthful, you're a liar, so if you say it is. But that's okay. Now here's what I'm gonna do. We've looked at five, so I'm probably gonna, for part two, I'm, I'm probably going to work on six and just run some queries, or I may run five and just walk through them so you can see them, and just run the queries and let you see the results sets and all that business. But I'm more likely to start on six. Does that make sense? Now, for those of you out there in TV land, okay, thank you much for being here. Before I sign it off, anybody got a question? Yes, no? No questions? Okay, then we'll wrap up this part. I'll save this, I'll post it, and then I'll post a part two, uh, probably by Thursday or Friday, somewhere in there, and we'll cover part, and we'll cover lunch's database six. Okay? Okay, folks, thank you so much. Appreciate those of you who are here, and away we go.